Hello everyone, back with another installment for CAMP 51. Uh, today we're looking at chapter five, which is introduction to chemical reactions. We have five pieces of content to look at in this lecture. Conservation of mass, balancing chemical equations, conserved quantities, at least some initial conserved quantities, types of chemical reaction, and redox reactions. Okay, so let's get to it. I'll get my annotation spotlight on. Okay, so conservation of mass. We've already seen in this lecture series uh, Dalton's atomic theory, I believe, but here it is to repeat. Dalton's atomic theory came as a consequence of Dalton trying to interpret these three laws of matter. So law number one, uh, or at least the first law that we'll present is conservation of mass, discovered by Antoine Lavoisier, who was beheaded in the French Revolution. Ouch. Um, but basically, conservation of mass says that mass can neither be created nor destroyed, but you can interconvert mass between forms of matter. Okay, so essentially, if you have 10 grams of a, a material, later on, you'll still have 10 grams. It might be in different forms, but you'll still have... 10 grams of material that you can find if you look hard enough. Law of constant composition, this was Joseph Proust. Um, this essentially says that when objects with mass come together, they can do so, but in whole number ratios. So for example, a water molecule has always has two hydrogen masses to one oxygen mass to form a formula H2O, always if it doesn't, it's not water anymore. Multiple proportions uh, came from Dalton himself. And essentially, multiple proportions is a multiple of definite proportions or constant composition. So for example, law of constant composition would say that N2O is, is obeying it because you always have a two to one ratio of nitrogen to oxygen. But you can also have a one-to-one -one ratio of nitrogen to oxygen or a one-to-two ratio of nitrogen to oxygen, etc. Here you have the same stuff, namely nitrogen and oxygen, but it can come together in different definite proportions or different ratios with constant composition. So more than one constant composition is a multiple of constant compositions or a multiple of proportions. Based on these three laws of matter, Dalton formulated his atomic theory, which by today's standards is not exactly correct, but historically it was a, a leap that basically started the discipline of chemistry. So approximately chemistry started with Dalton's atomic theory. So essentially he said that atoms are the smallest indivisible particles of matter that still retain a chemical identity. Uh, this is true. Uh, so if you take a piece of iron and grind it down until theoretically the smallest thing that would still be iron if you were to build it back again, that thing would be an atom. Uh, postulate two, all atoms of an element are identical. This is no longer considered true by today's standards uh, because of isotopes. Uh, and Dalton just didn't know about the existence of isotopes back then. Atoms of different elements are chemically different. Uh, this is true. So for example, uh, atoms of iron are different than atoms of hydrogen, are different than atoms of oxygen, are different than any other atom of an element in the periodic table. Number four, atoms can combine in integer ratios to form compounds. Yes, and this was Dalton trying to encapsulate law of definite proportions and law of constant composition, which is the same thing. And finally, number five, chemical reactions involve a rearrangement of atoms, not the change in the atoms themselves. This is true. So chemistry looks at taking atoms and rearranging them in whole number ratios with other atoms to form compounds. If you want to turn an element into a different element, you can do that, but not with chemistry. You'd have to go to nuclear physics to do that. So chemistry is all about using electrons. Uh, nuclear physics would alter the nuclear structure of atoms, but that's not what we're talking about in chemistry. 
Okay, balancing chemical equations. So based on Lavoisier's conservation of mass law, mass can never be created nor destroyed. Essentially, if you take the mass of your reactants on the left of the arrow, they must equal the mass of the products on the right of the arrow. One way you can fulfill this is to look at numbers of atoms. So for example, if you take this balanced chemical equation, which reads two hydrogen molecules in a gaseous phase, plus an oxygen molecule in a gaseous phase, gives two water molecules in the liquid phase, you can see that the coefficient two multiplies the H2. So the two multiplies the two, so we have four H's. So here's visually what two hydrogen molecules are like, a single bond between the two hydrogens, so four hydrogens total. Then we have an oxygen molecule that has a double bond between two oxygens. So in all, as reactants, we have four hydrogen atoms and two oxygen atoms. On the product side, we have two water molecules. Well, water molecules have this bent structure as shown. Uh, each water molecule has two hydrogens and one oxygen. So if we count the total number of hydrogens and oxygens in the product, we have four hydrogens and two oxygens. That exactly equals the four hydrogens and two oxygens on the reactant side. So because we have the same number of elements on both sides, and each element has a fixed mass, then we are guaranteed to have the same mass. So to guarantee conservation of mass, all we need to do when we balance a chemical equation is to have the same number of each element on either side of the atom. But more on balancing the equation later. When you, so this slide just reiterates, uh, when you balance chemical equations, we have to make sure the total number of elements on either side are the same. And to do that, we can't change the chemical itself by adding subscripts. We can only change the quantity of chemical by adding coefficients. So for example, you can see with HCl, there are no, well, I guess the fact that you don't see any subscripts means they're all one. So we have one hydrogen, one chlorine, uh, but I've got a multiple of six. So in total, I've got six hydrogens uh, on the reactant side. On the product side, I have H2. So that subscript two belongs to the chemical H. Um, all I can do to balance the six hydrogens on the left is to add a coefficient three. The three is now gonna multiply the two to give me six total hydrogens on the right. Um, I've got two aluminum reactants. So I can add a coefficient two in front of aluminum chloride to have two aluminum. The coefficient two also multiplies the three chlorides to give me six chlorides total on the product side. Well, that's fine because the six that multiplied the hydrogen on the reactant side is now also multiplied by the six. So I have six chlorides on the reactant side. So now if you look, all elements are balanced. I have an equal number of elements on both sides. Conserved quantities. So in the following chapters, we'll be looking at a quantity called the mole. In this chapter, we won't. All we're going to look at in terms of conserved quantities, other than mass is conserved, is the number of molecules. Um, uh, or rather, not the number of molecules, because um, that's not true. We're going to look at the essentially just to build on the number of um, elements within a molecule. It's kind of tricky. I'm trying to avoid saying the word mole. Um, the easiest thing in the world to do would just be get to straight to mole. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna delay that to the next chapter. Anyway, without further ado, let's look at this equation. So this is a combustion reaction between um, let's see C two H two. So that's going to be uh, ethylene and oxygen to give, I uh, know oh it's not ethylene, it's going to be ethylene, which is acetylene. I guess that would be the older name, but ethylene would be the common name, uh, the modern name. And five oxygen to give four carbon dioxide and two water molecules. 
So we know that these molecules react in a two to five to four to two ratio. So I can set any of these coefficients equal to each other. So for example, it says to know how many CO2 molecules are formed uh, when 26 molecules of C2H2 are reacted. Okay, well, if I know I have 26 molecules of C2H2, I have to look at the relationship between C2H2 and CO2 to learn how many molecules of CO2 are produced. And as you can see with the highlighting here, the CO2 to C2H2 ratio is four to two. So to calculate the amount of CO2 produced, I have this four to two CO2 to C2H2 mole ratio. And then my input of C2H2 is 26. And that eventually gives me 52 molecules of CO2. So once I have a balanced chemical equation and I get these coefficients, I can set any of these two coefficients equal to each other, and I can propagate other conserved quantities. So this will be the basis that's developed next chapter when we look at models. Now we're gonna look at types of chemical reactions. Uh, there are many types of chemical reaction. Uh, there are several important ones that we'll need in this GOB class. Um, Two are shown here. On the left, we have combination reactions. These are also known as synthesis reactions or composition reactions. And as you can see, we're essentially taking smaller units of chemicals and we're making more complicated, fewer units of chemicals. So for example, in the first reaction, we have hydrogen and nitrogen, and we're making ammonia. Second reaction, we have magnesium oxide and carbon dioxide, and we're making magnesium carbonate. Then we have carbon monoxide and oxygen to make carbon dioxide. Finally, sodium and chlorine to make sodium chloride. So what these all have in common, we're making something more complicated out of more simple starting materials. On the flip side of this, on the right, we have decomposition. You can think of decomposition as the reverse of synthesis. We're breaking more complicated molecules down into simpler constituents. So the first one we have ferric hydroxide or iron three hydroxide. The triangle just means heat. So we're adding heat to decompose the structure to give iron three oxide or ferric oxide and water. Second example, water plus electricity. So this is an electrochemical reaction can be decomposed to give hydrogen and oxygen. The reverse of this would be a synthesis of water. Third example, we have silver bromide. H nu is just an energy uh, photon of light. So we use in photochemistry to break down silver bromine, to give silver and bromine. And then finally, carbonic acid will decompose to give carbon dioxide and water. Other types of chemical reactions are combustion. Combustion essentially we're taking a fuel um, and oxygen, and we're adding oxygen to every constituent element in the fuel. So if your fuel is just carbon, we add oxygen to carbon, we make CO2. If your fuel is propane, which is what the, the gas we use in camping gas, for example, um, or in the gas that you would grill outside in the summer, um, propane tank, then, or I guess a forklift, you can have propane powered forklifts. Um, you can see that that fuel contains carbon and hydrogen. So you'd add oxygen to carbon to make CO2. You'd also add oxygen to hydrogen to make H2O, and the coefficients are added to balance the equation. Uh, methanol. You add oxygen to the carbon in methanol to make CO2. And then finally, the hydrogen in methanol to make H2O. There's oxygen in methanol, but oxygen doesn't add to oxygen uh, under combustion conditions. And then finally, acetone, which is a key ingredient in nail polish removal. Yummy. So we add oxygen to carbon to make CO2. We add oxygen to hydrogen to make H2O. Again, under these conditions, we would not add oxygen to oxygen. Another type of reaction 
uh, double displacement. Double displacement, or as it's also known, double replacement, fulfills this criterion here. So you have two ionic compounds, AB and CD, and then you just rearrange the ions to make two alternative ionic compounds, AB and CB. We can see this with these examples. Here, the KBr from potassium bromide and the AgNO3 from silver nitrate recombine to give potassium nitrate and silver bromide. Here, the down arrow just means it falls out of solution as a precipitate. And we would see um, the solid silver bromide from in the solution. For a double replacement reaction to happen, you need precipitation to happen. So in all these examples, we will have a precipitate. Um, the uh, down arrow here represents precipitation of a solid formed in the solution. Water would precipitate as a liquid. So although you might not see it, it's still precipitating in the solution. And then here, H2S, the up arrow, this symbolizes uh, production of a gas. But again, a gas, a solid or a liquid are all forms of precipitates. So essentially anything that's not an aqueous solution would be considered a precipitate that would drive the reaction forward and prevent the reverse reaction. Uh, so again, looking at all these examples, we have two ionic compounds initially, we exchange partners, we have two different ionic compounds Finally. Single replacement or single displacement reactions uh, are similar to double replacement, although we just have one ionic compound and an element. The ion, the element uh, competes with the cation of the ionic compound to become a cation, and then the original cation is ejected to become an element. So we essentially have a change of the cation and element to form a new ion of compound and a new ion. We can see in the first example, potassium can successfully compete uh, H plus cations in water molecules to make a new ion of compound, potassium hydroxide, and eject hydrogen gas, which is a precipitate. Magnesium can compete with copper two in the compound copper two nitrate. Um, this should be a Roman number two here. And think of that word, copper two nitrate. Uh, magnesium nitrate is the new ionic compound formed along with the precipitate copper. Zinc uh, can compete with hyd uh, hydrogen cations and hydrochloric acid to generate the new ion compound zinc chloride and precipitate hydrogen gas. And then finally, chlorine can compete um, with. Uh, the anion in calcium iodide to make calcium chloride and eject uh, iodine, uh, which will be a precipitate. Uh, iodine is likely to be a solid gaseous precipitate because it can sublime under room temperature between the solid and gas phase. But either way, it's a precipitate. Okay, the last two slides, we're going to look at the final type of chemical reaction, uh, that at least that we'll have to think about in chem, with the on our GLB chemistry, and that is redox chemistry. Um, so redox is an acronym that combines two, well, it's not an acronym, it's the truncation of two words, reduction and oxidation. Um, so we can see here with redox, uh, we have an exchange of electrons. Reduction is the law. Reduction, sorry, is the gain of electrons. Oxidation is the loss of electrons. So we have chemicals that lose electrons and are oxidized. Other chemicals that gain electrons and are reduced. So we have this exchange of electrons between uh, reduction and oxidation. Once the chemicals undergo oxidation or reduction, they can change or constituents and then can change oxidation state. And that's how we can identify the presence of redox to begin with. We look for elements whose oxidation state changes. 
Okay, so we have some rules. First rule is atoms in the pure elemental state, their oxidation state is always zero. Um, and this is regardless of whether they are a solid or a gas. Um, if you um, are just a regular element, not in a compound, no matter if you're a solid liquid or a gas, you're in a zero oxidation state because you have all your electrons. So long as you have all of your electrons, you're in a zero oxidation state. If you're a monatomic ion, so that means an ion composed of a single element, monatomic, then your charge is numerically equal to your oxidation state. It does not mean your charge is your oxidation state. It just means that they are numerically equal. If you are a compound, um, either ionic or covalent, we know from previous uh, discussions the sum of your constituent elemental charges must be zero. That means the sum of all your oxidation states must be zero. If you're a polyatomic ion, that means an ion made of more than one atom, with the charge spread over all atoms, then the sum of all your oxidation states is numerically equal to the charge on the ion itself. Okay. Um, another thing that we should mention here is in this box over on the right side. So we've said that oxidation is the loss of electrons. Another way to think of it is the gain of oxidation state. Reduction is the gain of electrons or the reduction in oxidation state. Um, compounds that undergo oxidation are called reducing agents. Compounds that undergo reduction are known as oxidizing agents. So typically you'll have to assign oxidation states. You'll have to identify reducing and oxidizing agent. Okay. So here's just some practice. Uh, essentially, you would do homework questions to practice these ideas. So we're asked to assign oxidation states uh, to the atoms in the following ion. So here we have the bicarbonate ion, HCO3 minus. We preferentially consider the most electronegative element first. So here, oxygen is most electronegative. That means it would have an oxidation state numerically equal to its charge. Its charge would be negative two. So we'll assume its oxidation state is negative two. And we have three of them in bicarbonate. So oxygen contributes a negative six charge. We know hydrogen is typically capable of forming a plus one charge. So let's go ahead and assign it a plus one charge with one of them. And then we solve whatever is left. And whatever's left is the oxidation state of carbon that when summed together with hydrogen and oxygen would give the overall charge on the polyatomic ion. So once we solve for X here, we see it's four because one multiple of one plus one multiple of four plus three multiples of negative two all produces negative one. So we've learned the oxidation state of all three elements in bicarbonate ion, plus one, minus two, and plus four for H, O, and C respectively. Calcium cyanide, we know that as a um, S block metal, calcium forms a plus two charge. So we assign it a plus two oxidation state in order to run it down. We know that nitrogen is the most electronegative of these three. We assign it its preferential negative three charge or its negative three uh, oxidation state. And there are two of them. And we solve for carbon. So solving for carbon, carbon must be in the plus two oxidation state because only then will the sum of all these oxidation states and their multiples give zero. Why zero? Well, there's no residual charge on this compound. And then finally, iron two phosphide. Iron is a transition metal, so it has an opportunity to have more than one type of uh, oxidation state of charge. So we have to solve for it. Phosphorus must form a negative three oxidation state. 
form, but not must. Phosphorus tends to form a negative three oxygen C. And we have two phosphorus. So that would be two by negative three. That's negative six contribution. I've got three ions. So three X plus six, uh, sorry, three X minus six is zero. Solving for X, X must be positive two. That's the only way to give a net zero charge to this compound overall. Okay, and that will conclude this video.